there are, with every sort of modeling method, uh, sources of errors. So our um, dating of morphology is no different. Okay? There are many sources of errors. We may have an incorrect phylogeny. We haven't sampled sufficiently across our, across our group. Or you know, we don't have enough um, sequence region that's going to uh, define the relationships well. Okay? Maybe we've rooted our tree incorrectly. All of these will have, obviously, a knock-on effect to any dates that we employ, employ to any nodes. Okay? Uh, rate heterogeneity. So if we've got one clade that has a faster substitution rate for biological reasons, for uh, geographic regions, it's in an area with um, higher radiation, is, is, is thought to perhaps co cause higher substitution rates for some groups. When you have high rate heterogeneity, this can be a, a major source of error in your dating. Okay? There's also the issue of generation times. If you've got sister species with very different generation times, then uh, the, 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 the time that they experience doesn't relate to the generations that they experience. And so more generations means more opportunity for uh, uh, substitutions. Okay? And then there's the issue of, um, sort of orthology or paralogy. So if we've got gene duplications or actually the, the, the genes that we're aligning are, don't share the same evolutionary history, then our dates are going to be incorrect. So the other, another source of error uh, is our calibration points. Okay? Our, the, the ages that we assign are entirely dependent on the calibration that we use to fix one or more nodes in order to read off all of the other ages. Um, um, we can use, there's three main um, uh, pieces of evidence we can use to calibrate our trees. Fossils are, in, in, many, in many views, the best thing that we can use to date our, uh, to, to calibrate our phylogenies. So this is, if we can identify a particular fossil being at a particular point on our tree, then we can say, okay, this is a minimum age for this node, okay? We know that this node is at least this age because we've got evidence that this lineage was existing at this particular time. Geography can provide maximum ages. So if we, if we have, if we have a strong um, evidence that suggests that these particular lineages were split because of a particular geographic event, say the forming of a, of a sea or spreading a part of continents, okay, then we can use that as a calibration. And secondary, secondary calibrations are also possible. So somebody else has dated a tree that's got your outgroup in it, uh, so, uh, therefore, you can use that to calibrate your tree. So, ultimately, this relies on one of these other things. But often, people use secondary calibrations because there are there are many large um, sort of family level or, or, or larger um, larger scale datings that have used lots of fossil evidence, and maybe your group doesn't have any fossils. So therefore, you're, you're, you're dependent on uh, a secondary calibration. So there's problems with um, using fossils for calibrating your, your, your phylogeny. Okay? If you can identify a fossil as a particular lineage on your tree, and this is quite difficult, it needs to have a character in place that is shared by this group but not this group. Obviously, fossils are incomplete for many groups, or for every group, really. uh, and perhaps the character that determines your group isn't present on the fossil. So this is, it becomes difficult to position your fossil exactly here or here on your phylogeny. If you can do that, then you've got the issue of, okay, where, which part of the tree does this represent? Does it represent the stem of, the, of this lineage, or does it represent the crown of this lineage? A 
and this might be you know a significant period of time according to your flow logic and so if you put it here or you put it here as your fixed calibration point you're going to have a significant difference in all of your other dates okay now so far we've talked about the sort of error associated with the tree but there's also the dating error associated with a fossil okay you you you, you, you look at fossils and we, we can't date them exactly we can say that they're from you know maybe this epoch or you know uh, it, it's probably going to be it's probably going to span several million years so we can say that somewhere along this lineage which in itself might represent several million years we've got a calibration point that's correct to several million years okay so we've got error associated with the date of the fossil we've got the uncertainty about where to put it even if we can directly identify this lineage we've still got the error associated with here or here okay also uh, commonly um, a, a common interpretation is okay people take the midpoint of the age range of a fossil so yeah and that's the age and then they stick it at one point on this tree okay and then they read off exactly those ages and say okay this lineage is then 3.25 million years old okay this is this is wrong mm -hmm. okay it's wrong we can't we can't have that degree of certainty our fossil is always a minimum age estimate okay the fossil record is incomplete we haven't got a complete fossil record. This fossil, okay, uh, may be fixed at this particular date, but we can't say that, you know, in next year, another site is gonna dig up something very similar to this, but that's three million years older, or, yeah? So, um, we always have to treat fossil calibration as minimum age calibration, okay? So there's always uncertainty and we should always interpret our ages as, if we're using fossil calibration, as minimum ages. Uh, when you analyze geological timetable, yes. you, you will have uh, the below errors, larger millions of years, yes. but at the tip there are less. Uh, yes. Does that exactly. make a difference? Yes, yes so it makes a difference. So you should, you should with, your, with the fossils, with the fossil in, information that they, they ought to come if they've been like say carbon dated or something uh, or they've used some geological dating that dating will come with an age range and the more recent past there'll be a, a, a much narrower age range uh, in terms of you know, what, what, what might be the uh, error associated with that dating and the further back in time you go the, the larger your errors the, 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 the uncertainty is should pretty call it error but maybe uncertainty is a better better word to use and and that actually applies to your dating as well um, uh, for exactly the same reason you can get you can get the better confidence intervals on the more recent uh, 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 ancestors and uh, uh, less confidence wider wider error bars associated with the deeper nodes on the tree Okay. When you come to do calibration, if you can get fossils, then the more fossils that you can apply to your tree, the, the more robust your results will be. Okay. That's not a, it's not a particularly um, unobvious point, but the more data you put in, the, the, more, the more robust your results will be. So you can do things like, if you've got multiple <coughs> fossils, you can date with <laughs> you know, do three different dates, compare the dates that you get, and if you if you get like one that's in disagreement, then you use the, the ones that are in agreement, okay? Um, and hopefully that will get you a, uh, a, a more robust result. Okay? We can also try to uh, assign confidence intervals around our dates, okay? And these are these are based on um, the uncertainty associated with the molecular data rather than the uncertainty associated with the uh, calibration data. Okay? Uh, 
the, the, the older method for, for this is a bootstrapping technique. So essentially you just resample your molecular, molecular data, rebuild your phylogeny based on that resampled data set, and then use that, use those replications with slightly different data sets each time. Each one dates give you a, a slightly different age range, and then you look at the average of those and the sort of minimum and maximum or the confidence intervals of those replications in order to give you a, a confidence interval around your age. Um, the, the, uh, the sort of current popular methods that integrate dating with your phylogenetic reconstruction are Bayesian methods. So the Bayesian methods obviously give you multiple trees in your results that you then combine into a consensus. Um, those multiple trees that are all dated give you replicate ages for each node across multiple phylogenies. And then you, again, you just combine those together and give yourself sort of a mean and a confidence interval around those replicates in order to give you a confidence interval on your data. <coughs> So the BEAST software is the thing that you really have to use at the moment in order to get something published. Okay? If, you've got, if your data conforms to a clock, molecular clock, which is, I think I remember reading somewhere that it's about 40% of data sets conform to a clock, but of, of all the trees that I've done, only one has ever conformed to a clock. Um, uh, so the Beast software actually provides quite a good set of tools. You can do the you can do the phylogenetic reconstruction. You can do the multiple tree to work out confidence intervals using the tree annotator software, and then the fig tree um, um, tree visualization tool actually displays the confidence intervals around the node ages. Oops. Okay, so this is this is fig tree with a phylogeny with the uh, confidence intervals around the dating. Um, and this is a sort of typical example following on the, the, the recent the recent nodes have um, narrow confidence intervals and as you move further back in the tree you get broader and broader um, uncertainty on your ages. And this this sort of picture is, is typical in what you'd see in publications on this sort of, in this sort of uh, field. Um, so, in, in summary, um, uh, many of your trees re reject the clock, so you need to do some rate smoothing. Okay? Um, it, it can be computationally expensive, obviously, if you're, if you're doing extra computations uh, uh, on top of your phylogenetic reconstruction, that takes a little bit longer to run. Okay? But, obviously, with computer speeds increasing, um, and, uh, servers becoming more available, it, 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 it's, it's possible to do reasonably large phylogenies with this in, in short time frames. Um, I like this quote from Mike Sanders on, on his rate smoothing software. He's always surprised when it works. Um, so uh, there's lots of uncertainty and it's a controversial topic, so why do we bother? Well it allows us to, to assess by geographic questions. Okay? If we've got this sort of geographic pattern and we can date the tree to somewhere in the recent past, then the inference is a dispersal event. Mm -hmm. If we can date the tree to uh, uh, some point when we think there was a geographic <coughs> connection between these areas, then we can infer a bicarious event as the, as the land masses split apart or some, of the ge some geographic event separated the populations, okay? We can then infer that that was a barrier to gene flow and that caused the lineage diversions, okay? So by dating, we can directly um, hypothesize on the cause of speciation in, in these sort of circumstances. 